Welcome, everyone. Uh, we are back with another podcast for you, and uh, we're going to continue a bit on a theme from our previous podcast. Today, we're going to be talking about future modes of communication, and joining me, John Arnold, is my colleague, Chris Fine. Chris, welcome back for another another edition. Thanks, John. Good to be here. All right. Thank you as well. So we, uh, we get in the groove with these podcasts. It's easy to go on and on, but let's uh, hone in on this topic that I know can go in several directions, but it's really about the modes of communication and how they're evolving in the workplace right now. So let me, let's start from your end. You, you've been doing a fair bit of work in the kind of workplace, uh, the digital workplace environment now, and obviously big changes are coming, but some are subtle too, right? Yes, well, some are actually physical, um, which is very interesting. One of the things you're seeing more and more is uh, is a lack of actual telephones in the workplace. So people are either communicating on laptops with headsets or they're using their personal devices to communicate. And they're also doing fewer point-to-point communications, i.e. just picking up what would have been the phone and calling somebody more using tools like Slack. And I, so this intrigues me, especially since we talked last week about Twilio, who is a major innovator in modes of communication. We also have talked about some other companies in the space. And I also had heard that you gave a, a, a webinar the other day about the death of the PBX. So it sounds like you've got some thoughts in this space as well. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Chris. As you say, the, the physical changes are what the end users, the workers, uh, see in the workplace environment. And, uh, there's certainly some interesting trends about the, first is the actual presence of the phone on the desk. And in some cases, it is going away. There are companies, especially, you know, smaller, younger startups, uh, run by uh, millennials, etc., who don't use desk phones at all, and they certainly don't use them in their homes. And for them, they've dispensed with the phone altogether, and they do everything mobile or through their computers. And that, I think, for that situation, can be a viable model. I'm not sure it scales very well, but it certainly proves that you don't have to have a desk phone to uh, be effective in the way you run your day-to-day business. But I think more likely what you're seeing is the desk phones are still on those desks, but they're not being used as much or certainly the way they used to be. Uh, I think this, that, that's pretty clear across the board, regardless of the age uh, of people in the office. Well, John, I think it depends on the layout of the office. And if I were to forecast any trends that I see pretty broadly out there, and I don't think this is a huge surprise, is that the move to more open configurations tends to move away from phones because of the wiring issues and the fact that positions aren't really fixed. And so it, it, it is, I do think it's changing. It never goes to zero phones that I've seen, but you do end up, for example, where uh, the majority may be extensions at uh, spots like the guard desk and the, the a conference room, you know, a Polycom or Zoom or Cisco or anybody who's in the conference room, audiovisual is likely to be a more traditional type of set, whether it's connected to the network wirelessly or wired. But uh, if I were to guess a trend, I think actually the sheer layout of the workplace, plus the, the statistics that fewer and fewer people are actually using telephone sets or traditional sets, is going to prompt IT and the business and the business management to say, why are we supplying them? And and that's usually what happens when devices get used less and less in the corporate setting. Yeah, and um, this, this brings to mind a bit of uh, some of the nomenclature that we're so kind of hardwired to. You yeah. know, we still talk about movies as films, and you know, they're not making film stock so much anymore. And smartphones, you know. We call them phones, but, you know, we, making phone calls is one of the last things we do on our smartphones. And it's going to come to this term of the desk phone as well, because, as you say, if we are going to this more common space, you know, long table, open environment, well, people 
if they don't have desks anymore, private spaces to do work, you know, the, the concept of a desk phone kind of becomes, you know, archaic because there won't be a desk for people to ha- put a phone on, right? If they're all sharing these open spaces or they're hoteling, they might use a common phone. But um, again, this, this personal thing of every employee has a dedicated phone and a dedicated extension, um, that's just not really reflecting the way the workplace is evolving, right? Right. And another interesting practice, which we as telephone veterans may find somewhat amusing, is the resurfacing of what are called phone booths without actual phones in them Mm -hmm. uh, this time. So somebody told me there's a market actually in surplus old original phone booths, which get refurbed and put in as a retro art piece, but without a phone. So in in sort of a next-gen cool workspace, you've got the old phone booth there, but there's no phone. And you still got the old fan, and it says phone on top and the little seat. But so it, it actually does also highlight another idea, which is as all of this evolves, there's a very different approach to privacy, and privacy is actually an issue in this new world where you don't yeah. have individual positions. Um, so I think it's going to be a challenge of designers and technologists and the business to to balance that uh, that need for privacy occasionally with the layout of space and how everything's configured. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm throwing back to what our generation would remember, but you know, hey, that the cone of silence is probably still a pretty good idea. As is the shoe phone, by the way. There, there, there could be a market for that. I don't know. <laughs> but, you know, that privacy thing is is so big, and that's going to bring us to another variation of this, and that's, you know, the Alexa on the desktop, Alexa for business, Google, you know, Assistant. These devices are going to start to really show up in the workplace now, and people are going to use them just the way they use them at home. But because they're so passive, Boy, they certainly can very easily become, you know, audio monitoring stations. So everything you say, whether you like it or not, could easily be tracked, archived, harvested, blah, blah, blah. So you talk about privacy, you know, like you, if you can't hide in a refurb phone booth, there's really nowhere to go. And when those things become everywhere, you're going to, there's going to be ongoing monitoring of, of your day-to-day activities and it's kind of scary in a way um that that's how it could go I'm not saying it will go that way but the potential is there for sure i think that savvy enterprises that set this stuff up are going to set guidelines and depending on the industry they're in and requirements of compliance or regulation or lack thereof will set policies corporate policies about what they retain and what they don't retain and you mentioned a very good point, which is that there are actual multiple aspects to privacy. There's physical privacy, which we kind of, you know, talk about the phone booths and the cone of silence and where do you go to make a, have a private conversation, uh, which is as much an architectural issue as it is a technology issue. But there's also data. And your point about the voice interfaces is, I agree with it 100%. I think it's going to be more and more a factor. And what that equates to effectively is that in many situations, there is a a machine of some kind, an AI or whatever, effectively bridged into the conversation. And there will be lots of definitions necessary to to define what are permitted and what are not permitted in terms of actions and retention and compliance around all of that. So, Hopefully, all of that works in tandem with the deployment of the technology, but it's definitely going to be a factor. And when you when you when you include things like GDPR in the regulations that started in Europe, they're likely to go more broadly. Uh, you really have to think about this stuff with the data. Yeah, and you know when you talk about privacy, you know security goes hand in hand, and I think that's going to be another big ask for IT is to say, well, with these new devices coming in, how are we going to secure or network, because just like management could be listening in on their, you know, slow to work workers to keep on them. And all of a sudden they'll start, you know, barking instructions over the Alexa to say, hey, your 
not working fast enough, you know, it's kind of scary. But, you know, take it a step further and what's to stop competitors from hacking your network and listening in on the strategic planning session in the conference room, right? That could happen. And I'm sure people will figure out ways to do it. So, you know, it's it, that's a bigger level concern. So you bring this Pandora's box into the office to enable, you know, smart assistance, which is a good thing for sure. But at the same time, if IT isn't thinking broadly enough, network security, you know, has a, a new requirement to make sure these things are not used in the wrong way. Agreed 100 percent. I think that you have to take an approach to this generally referred to as defense in depth, where you have to think of security in multiple layers. And at the very minimum, it's 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 an extension and growth of what type of thinking had to be necessary when bring your own device was first deployed in, in the enterprise, particularly within corporate space. And you then have to take it into all the other levels that you need to think about with these new tools if you want to be secure. Um, certainly a secure and scalable network platform is part of that. Uh, and certainly the, the companies in that space are thinking about that and, to, and starting to offer products for it uh, or are out there with products for it. But mm-hmm. you have to you have to think about it at multiple levels and, and and consider the security of each one. I actually think that that particular consideration of security is going to be uh, not a blocker but a gating factor in the deployment of Alexa type voice interfaces in especially industries where it's more sensitive. Um, I I don't think it's going to stop it. I think this is inevitable, but I think that companies may be somewhat uneasy about wholesale adopting that uh, without really thinking through the security and privacy implications and potential liability. Having said that, would they deploy it as a proof of concept or would they deploy it in certain areas where it kind of matters less and where they're walled off from the sensitive areas? Then yes, there's probably a way to trial this and see how useful it is and build new products and new applications around it with it with incurring less risk. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that is a topic for another time. Well, with that, I think we are on time. So, Chris, Great. let's uh, wrap up now and thank our listeners again. And we hope you got something good out of this. We'd certainly love to talk with you further about these trends and ways that we can help you understand them and make sure your business gets the right benefit from them. So that's our story for today, and uh, we'll be back again with another podcast. So again, from Chris and myself, we'll thank you for listening in, and we'll catch you again on the next podcast. Thanks, John. We'll talk again soon. Cast.